Do you think I'm gonna lose this fight? No. Good. Me neither. Hello humans, welcome to the M-Word, the Manx Sports Podcast brought to you by Martin, that's me, and Matt, that's him. Welcome back people, I hope you're all well. Uh, just to kick off, first of all, we'd just like to thank our show sponsor, Billboards.im. As I said previously, it does exactly what it says on the tin, which is billboard advertising, but does it digitally, uh, and you'll have seen them down the sea terminal and up, out through town, so if you want to get your brand out there, get your message out to the, to the public. They're, they're the guys to go and see so go and visit billboards.im today and we'd obviously just like to thank them for their help with us they're the future of advertising on the RMAT. Uh, so Matthew in our introduction there we had a uh, some audio does the uh, voice it's a clip from a movie does it ring any bells with you no unfortunately no. I'm gonna have to go three for three on uh, the uh, intros <laughs> okay so so it's from a actually from a boxing movie called uh, bleed of this right. heard of that no, no? okay it, it's about an American boxer who uh, was at the top of his game, moving up through the ranks, and had a, a bad car accident. Ended up with a halo, helping support his neck, etc. Oh, okay. uh, had to re- obviously go through a lot of rehab to get back into the ring. And uh, v- uh, Vinny Paz was the name of the boxer, so feel free to look him up. He t- and obviously he dealt with a lot of adversity in his life, uh, getting through that that injury ultimately, which ties in nicely to our guest today, who's joined us in the studio to really chat about his career up to this point, how how he how he worked through through the cycling ranks on the island and then internationally. So welcome, Johnny Bellis. Thank Thanks for your time, Thank for you. coming in. Thanks for having me. <laughs> no, pleasure, absolute pleasure. So the first question we ask all, all guests, Johnny, is are you uh, coming over a Manx, Manx Manx, or Manx is the Hills? Definitely Manx is the Hills. Oh, yeah? <laughs> yeah. Family, whole, whole family yeah. from the Isle of Man. Somebody said to me the other day, they said, oh, you're the Manxest person I've ever met. Oh, right, I'm, okay. I was like to myself, really? Yeah, yeah. I'm sure there's a lot more Manx people out there than me. <laughs> the Manx farmer, and you. I think yeah. about now it is quite. Yeah, I've got quite a strong, quite strong. Coming from me, I appreciate that's quite ironic, but quite a Manx accent. Yeah, that's not a bad thing. No, no, absolutely proud. Should be proud of it. Yeah. Proud of it. No, I am. Yeah. Okay. So, known for cycling, early days. What got you into the sport? What attracted you to start riding a bike? Um, I was basically one of those kids. When I was growing up, I just wanted to do all kinds of sports. So I was doing rugby, football, cricket, yeah. um, swimming, running as well. And um, so literally every day of the week, I'd be absolutely knackered. I'd wake up at school the next day, and I'd just be like, oh, I'm so tired. I just want to lie in bed longer because I'd be doing an activity after school every night of the week and even the weekends as well. Um, and luckily, I was quite good at all of them. You know, I represent the island in all of them as well so I was quite lucky at that but then sort of come to a point at like 15 I thought well I can't really do all these sports anymore so I sort of need to decide which ones I actually want to do so I decided to go with just rugby and cycling oh, right. um, and again I was really good at rugby I you know I played at quite a high level you know I went to Castle Russian mm-hmm. and they ended up playing in Twickenham in the day in the Mail Cup final we ended oh, up right. winning there as well so that was pretty cool to come out at half time and play against thirty thousand people was pretty special. So, you know, that was you know, that was really proud. And was that at fifteen? That was at fifteen, mm-hmm. yeah. Um so that was good. So initially then at that time it was rugby I wanted to do, you know, I was playing for Cheshire as well, a county and I was doing all that and you know So you're travelling away. So I was playing. travelling away doing that and you know, I, but that wasn't just weekends, that was going away in the week and obviously games at the weekends and you know, it become a little bit too much as well, especially trying to study at school and travelling away all the time doing that. Um, and then I just thought, well, cycling always become a bit more natural to me. You know, I sort of didn't have to work as hard. Not that I don't mind working hard, but I sort of was a bit more natural to me. Mm. So I just sort of stopped with the rugby and then just thought, I'll just give it everything with cycling, just to see where it takes me, really. And at that 13, 14, 15 age, were you racing locally on the island? Yeah, I was racing locally, yeah. I mean, I was, <clears> you know, I was lucky to have sort of dots. Um, it was Scottish Provident back then. I think it's RL 360 now, wasn't it? Um, mm. So, yeah, I was going down there on a Tuesday night, every Tuesday, and I'd be doing a 10 mile, the local 10s on a Wednesday. And then um, I think and then the bike styles come around then, and then I started doing the bike style as well, and then the odd race at the weekend or traveling away. Going to races that way. And who was in your age category around that time? Um, locally. Yeah. Um, so I had. So I had Pete Kenyuk. He was a year below me, but whenever I was second year in the category, he'd always be in the first year. Um, so it was 
me and him, Mark Christian, is two years younger than me, so he was never sort of in my category. Um, then we just had like other guys that don't ride anymore, like um, Chris Nicholson. Would he be around your age? He's younger than me again, mm. so he was he didn't really race against me. Um, and guys like Warren Flynn, people mm. like that, and like Ashley Whip, people like that. Those are the sort of guys who are my age. I was racing with locally, and like Christian and Cav, they were like Christian's I think four years older than me, and Cav's three years older. So again, I never really raced against. It was mainly Pete really. Like the when they had their hill climb series in the winter as well, we'd always do them. Just sort of be just me and Pete competing for our category mm-hmm. for the win, you know. So it was a uh, you know it was quite good. And again, like over here, there was all you could always you had that accessibility to be able to train with all the older guys as well anyway so it was always good to have that you just wouldn't race against them so yeah yeah and then uh, do, again during that period are you going away off Ireland and racing as well as going off Ireland and rugby um one when I was in the rugby I sort of I'd only go away cycling once a year mm. and that was like the Manchester youth tour so I can't remember what time of year that was but I'd just go away for that so we'd all go away as an Alaman team for like a week and race that, that was the only real, other than the regional, the Northwest uh, Divs, Divisional Champs, they were the only races we'd go away and ride, to be honest, so, but then, once I thought, I'm just going to go with cycling, which was my last year as a youth A, so an under 16, that's when I started to commit and go away a bit more, Mm. so my mum and dad bought a camper van, so we'd use that to go away, and uh, race, or the youth A. I was going to, well, I was going to ask then, yeah, the uh, parents supportive of both sports at that age then, and you do no sports? Um, yeah, they were, yeah. I mean, regardless of what sports I do, they always support me, but they were, you know, happy and willing to support me and essentially help me on the road to achieve what I wanted to do, which was essentially ride my bike full time as a job. So, and it, so uh, that was actually my next question. So then at that, that age, you thinking about maybe at 15, thinking about I can pursue whatever that career is in, in a direction was that on your mind or was it just I was doing it I was enjoying it and it was a hobby um, essentially I wanted I think deep down it was where I wanted to go as my job and make it a career but again I was sort of a little bit in the unknown I wasn't sure if I did actually have the ability to actually make it so I thought if I have a good winter the winter before my last year as a under 16 and then just give it everything I've got as a first year on the 16 and just see where it takes me and just sort of go from there really and um, the first British round that I went away to compete in it was end of March I think and I went there and I won it <laughs> so that was sort of an eye opener to me in so much as I, I sort of can don't got the ability and I can compete and sort of do this really and sort of take it from there So I assume looking up Cav and Christian were probably on the GB development squad at this stage so you can maybe see a path as well Yeah definitely I think the academy like my last year under 16 was I think the first year the uh, British Cycling under 23 academy started that year when mm. they were all sponsored by Purcell um, Oh right okay yeah So I think that was that then when that started and I think a lot of things in British Cycling did start to change because they were very much track orientated and sort of the road side they didn't you didn't really have a look in that way so i think they sort of, they did start to look at more road type riders and obviously i never ridden the track before in my life so i wouldn't have a clue if i was even competitive on the track at all so luckily that year as a first year on the 16 the british cycling talent team come over to Alaman to test riders to see if they were obviously capable to get onto the actual talent team so I done the test and I got onto the talent team then, so which is quite good. So it sort of meant we got a, a British cycling coach. We then go away. I can't remember exactly when it was. Maybe once every two months for like a weekend to ride the track, whether it be Manchester or Newport, just to see. Just this is at sixteen. Improve. Yeah, just on the sixteen, just to try and see where you would be on the actual track. So, um, so those were test specifically for track it wasn't they weren't looking at they were just basically general fitness tests really so you just they had like vo2 max type of test yeah it's like like a ramp test so Mm. you just had to get a certain number Mm. to sort of make the grade to actually get onto the town team so they had a sprint test and like an endurance test i think it was like three minutes and they just look at your 
average power, I think, or something mm-hmm. like that. So, yeah, I made that. So then I got onto the talent team, which was pretty good because you sort of, okay, it's not actually a full GB squad, but you sort of, the doors opened in that respect. So the, the guys actually working on the sort of like the junior national squad or whether it be the under 23, know you're sort of in that yeah. pool of talent. So they sort of look at you a bit more early and sort of monitor your progress during the year. And how did you find that transition from road to track? Um, people often ask, used to ask me this question, um, but um, at the end of the day, they both complement each other really. So I was, I my response to that every time would always be, well, it's racing and riding your bike, so I enjoy both really. So now I was lucky; I found myself. I was again quite good at both, so that sort of helped, and it helped me enjoy that bit more. So. Um, but yeah, no, I enjoyed riding the track. Did you have a preference, road or track, at, at that point when you're going away and doing it, thinking I might enjoy um, doing this? Not more? particularly, no. I mean, I track is sort of more uh, a winter type sport. So a lot of the events, you know, they are in the winter. So you know, you could work hard, whether it be in the gym, and then um, sort of build your endurance miles and then sort of race on the track at the same time so it'd, it'd help your road season in a way as well so you know it was quite good and sort of help keep your mind occupied in the sense of just having a long winter just riding endurance miles you know or just long and steady and going in the gym so having that variety within your train and then having a race to talk at the same time it sort of helped you know yeah maybe get that racing edge keep that racing edge doing the yeah morning. exactly yeah and you just it, you know it kept that top end leg speed you know within your legs and then if you're doing that all winter you know you'd find that you sort of your top end speed and your sprint sort of moved on to in comparison to what it was in the road season previously so so then so you mentioned earlier uh, under 16 you went away did the, the first round of the national series won that how did the rest of that year pan out at junior level um well that year again it went well um i won a, another couple of rounds uh the Alaman youth tour just started for the first time that year as well um, I think that was 2005, yeah, and I finished second overall in that, and I won a stage down at the NSC, right. um, down at the Bowl, so I think it was a split day, I think we had a time trial around the NSC in the morning, and then we had like the crit in the afternoon, and I won the crit, and then finished second overall, so again, yeah, I was happy with that, I finished second in the National Youth Circuit Race Champ, so, I mean, I was always there, like literally, Every race I rode, I was in the top five every time, so I knew, um, you know, that potentially I could move this forward, and then especially going into my first year as a junior the next year. Right, and then I presume the the belief then as you're kind of moving on is more and more that there's a potential avenue here to, I use the word GoPro, it's, it's easy to say in hindsight, but continue to develop the opportunity to potentially make a career of it. Yeah, definitely, I mean... Way I looked at it as well because a lot of times in a youth category, you know, guys and girls grow at different speeds. So sometimes, you know, you could be riding an under sixteen race and somebody has the body of a twenty five year old. You know, yeah. and you know, I sort of knew that I was, I mean, I wasn't sort of underdeveloped, but I was just sort of growing at a normal pace. So I knew that, you know, the talent I had wasn't just down to me being overdeveloped in any way at all. Yeah. So I knew that there was something there that I could potentially just keep progressing. That's all I was doing. And essentially, I always say this to a lot of people, you know, I was enjoying it all the time. I can't ever recall looking back in my cycling days, especially as a young rider, thinking, I don't enjoy this. Like literally every bike ride I went on, I was always enjoying it. Every race, I'd always enjoy it. I'd have fun. Okay, be nervous prior to a race because you obviously, you wanted to do your best, but I'd never look back and think, I'm not enjoying this because I think, well, what's the point if you're not enjoying it mm-hmm. you know I'm, I'm not getting paid to ride my bike so you know essentially it's a hobby and I want to enjoy doing it so that's a, a, an interesting comment actually because you see across all sports and speaking to other sports people as well that uh, that gets sometimes gets a bit lost because they're so focused on on the sport that it becomes it they maybe don't even realize but it becomes a chore it becomes a messing with the mind because it's I've got I've got to train I've got to do this I've got to do that and if you, you know it's a ultimately that level when you're at that level early either starting or just doing it as a hobby it's a hobby yeah. you sometimes need to take that step back and realise exactly and enjoy and I think like back then when I was a young rider you know there wasn't all this social media around you know the Instagrams and all these kind of things going on and there was no 
power meters around, you know, to be the odd person that had a power meter, where they'd be on a pro team. So, but nowadays it's like completely changed. You know, it's like I just used to go out when I was young. I just enjoy riding my bike. I mm-hmm. used to do laps around Bolden. I go down the prom. I they used to have these them chain gangs down at the bowl on a I can't remember when it was Tuesday night I think yeah. was it Tuesday night they were great as well you, even if you're young you just jump in go down ride down there and just jump on the back of all the older riders and just have a good blast round it was fun and yeah it's changed a bit nowadays so. yeah for sure so so through the junior ranks then you're obviously in the eyes of uh, GB your junior racing I guess more and more in the UK and racing the track during the winter yeah. Was that all under GB banner or was? Um, well, my first year as a senior, no, as a junior, sorry, um, I made the qualification standard for the track and the Alaman because I could race the track and the Alaman because you only had to be 17. And I was 17, you see. Okay. So I rode the Commonwealth Games on the track in Melbourne in 2006. Okay. So. Again, I was on GB then, so I went there, and I was just able to ride the track. So that was what. The, what was the event you did there? I had done the scratch race and the point race. Okay. Um, so How was I, that for an experience? Oh, it was massive. It was really good. Um, I obviously in the scratch race, Cav won gold, so that was obviously pretty special for the team. And then, so how that worked was five gained a lap, so Cav was obviously one of the five, and then he won the sprint to win gold and then I won the sprint of the rest of the group okay. and then I got sixth okay. so to finish sixth in my first Commonwealth Games you know, seven, 17 yeah, yeah. was pretty cool so I just went there I sort of I think we helped Cav out in the points race and then in the scratch race you know Cav won and then I got a little bonus result for myself as well so mm-hmm. right. I didn't know you'd gone to the where was it Melbourne did you say yeah in 2006 mm-hmm. yeah. I do love Melbourne great city yeah yeah, and how, well, say, how, how did you feel going into all that? I say you were, again, 17, yeah. going to represent against the best there yeah. is out there. Yeah. yeah, I don't know, really. I was just, well, yeah, I just wanted to go there just for experience. I mean, I was unaware because I was relatively inexperienced in terms of track races, so I didn't know if I, could, I was going to just get fired out the arse of the group or <laughs> be able to actually be relatively competitive. So, I mean, I just went in there just to try and help have as much as possible and that's again whether I did go out the back that if I helped him in any way whatever it may be you know I would have thought well I'd done my job mm. to the best I could so I just had to be happy regardless of the outcome so that's essentially all I could do so and was Team Alaman going there that's at that time thinking trying to think back obviously Cav had somewhat of a reputation at that, that time was, but was the mentality of the team is we've got we've got a medal opportunity here and we're, this is the the, you know, we're not here to make up the numbers as potential for, mm. for for a medal or medals. Yeah, definitely. I mean, and I think it was after Cav won Madison gold on the track, and obviously he won various other titles, European titles and national champ titles, and we knew that he had the pedigree to potentially win, whether it be the scratch race or the point race, but more so the scratch because ninety percent of the time they do finish in a small group or a full brunch sprint, and obviously Cav. He's not bad at sprinting. He's a pretty good sprinter, yeah. <laughs> not as yeah. quick as me. <laughs> um, but yeah, he's a pretty quick sprinter, so we knew that if he was there in the right position at the right time, that he would potentially win the race. So. Yeah. And yeah, obviously representing the Islands, I'm sure, is a special. I know. Yeah, and it's a, yeah, it's a rare occasion as well. So, I mean, obviously I looked up to Cav as well, and I was, you know, I was sharing a room with him in the Games Village and stuff, so he was, you know, really good in that respect. He sort of, help me out and give me lots of advice and mm. things like that so I could sort of he was always there I could always ask him questions wherever it may be about so you know it was good great experience we had we had such a laugh as well that we had such a good group of guys that were there as well it was so much fun so I really enjoyed it that that team team things is you know so important isn't that again cycling's often seen as a as an individual discipline sport but uh it's definitely not well it's probably maybe less so now you look at the bigger teams that all focus on one rider but at every level that's the team thing so important and having that team morale I guess as well yeah I mean it's got to be done I mean like the domestiques you know guys who work for the team leader within races you know people who just watch cycling they don't see these guys sitting on the front for hundreds of kilometres you know and then 
they just see the person who crosses the line with their hands in the air so on there but again that person wouldn't be crossing the line the hands with their hands in the air if it wasn't for them people yeah. previous before it was even shown on tv so they're the ones getting them bottles and things like that so it is very much team mm-hmm. orientated which is you know why i sort of fell in love with the sport at the same time as well so and at this time are you still in school or are you kind of full-time now um trying to make at this career? point i went to college to do my a levels so i was just doing two a levels up there so i was in like three and a half days a week at college that allowed me time mm-hmm. to train and ram my bike around that but then i was only in college for like um 10 months and then i got the call to get on the academy and then i just moved to manchester and i didn't even take any exams i just moved away <laughs> and just thought forget about it i'll just Did, see what yeah. happens and see if it works out so let's talk through that call did you expect that call could you kind of with your results thinking um well i knew like like my second year as a junior you know we went to the junior world and the junior europeans and you know i won european titles and we um we got bronze medal in the world team pursuit and i got second i got silver in the um world points race as a junior um so i knew that i was on the cards of the academy but obviously there's everyone couldn't be selected for the academy there's only so many places but um, i sort of knew i was pretty confident that i would have a good chance of getting on it and i did and i ended up ended up getting on it earlier than everybody else so i went earlier to ride with another member who was already on the academy to ride one of the under 26 six day events so i moved away earlier to manchester and then competed in a, an event in amsterdam yeah with him to ride that so we we eight what were you here? late late 17 early 18 yeah i think i turned because i made my births uh, my birthday's august so i think i just turned 18 and then i moved in september to manchester to be on the academy basically did it did it daunt you leaving you know i couldn't wait to be honest i just mm-hmm. knew that this is essentially what i wanted to do so i just wanted to move away and just ride my bike and just be involved in that structure that's been so successful in olympics and things like that so that's what i wanted to do really so and again um just hanging out with guys that are your age and share the same interests and essentially want to achieve what you want to achieve as well so and is that a house share over there they dump you in a house yeah Sounds basically dangerous. yeah that's so where they had in manchester in stockport they had three the uh, no three houses yeah and then we'd all split up within those houses um and then we just train around there train in manchester on the road and then we ride into the village room most days as well and we'd ride the track two times a day and then we'd have food there and then ride at need and then all ride home together so and that's all coach structured stuff that yeah, you'd be yeah. providing yeah rod ellingworth he was our academy coach so he'd mm. give you a weekly plan as to what we we're going to do each day and do that so and then we do that all winter so that'll be from like october till march next year and we'd be competing in all like the track world cups as well so during my first year as well in the academy we rode manchester world cup as a as a young squad and we got third in the world cup so we got bronze in the team pursuit and this was all like live on bbc and stuff mm-hmm. like that so you know again that was like you know that was amazing you know you know 18 year old lads on the bbc like yeah going up against spain for a bronze medal ride and we all won and obviously it's a packed out crowd in manchester so the atmosphere was just crazy so it was a really good experience to be stood there on the podium in the mm-hmm. manchester world cup and you talked earlier about you know say racing locally and you, you get no before races here you're moving up a level you're live on tv you're on the start line if, uh, is that much of that going through your mind and also in that gb squad i know they very much you know talk about doing the process and focusing on what you're doing do they help you get over the not get over the nerves but forget about what's going on around you that there's you know a packed audience and people on tv watching you yeah essentially yeah you just you know you go in with a plan and essentially all you do is just in your head you're just thinking right um it's team pursuit for example i know i've got four turns you know i just do them at a certain pace and we've got a good chance of winning the right. bronze medal it's quite it's clinical it's quite like. clinical yeah well i was i was man one in the team pursuit so you know i was coming out the start okay you know i was taking the team up to speed so now that's quite 
an important job, you know, doing that. So, but you know, I was confident that I had the strength to be able to do that. And again, I just come out that gate and just focused on doing my job and yeah, we won a bronze medal. So yeah, it's quite interesting. Yeah, it's quite it's interesting that whole yeah blocking out everything that's going on around. I assume you were were you nervous before the start of that? Um, looking back, a little bit, yeah. I mean, As you understandably, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I can't remember it's quite a long time ago now i can't remember exactly in terms of how nervous i was but yeah i'd imagine i was i mean there'd be something wrong if you wasn't nervous so um but yeah i was a little bit nervous but i just knew that i just get out got to get out that gate and just take the team up to speed and then just the rest will be sort yeah. of yeah. left on the track type of thing so uh then you move in 18 you're starting to I guess I'm trying to think when you move into senior ranks at that. So at the end of eight, when you're at the end of eighteen, you then move into senior ranks. Yeah. So eighteen, yeah, you're sort of first year senior. So like first year under twenty three. So what well, the academy that step up? Um, again, I was wasn't sure. You know, I didn't know what to expect. But well, the academy they had a base in Italy. So in March the following year in two thousand seven, we all moved out to race in Italy. So we just stay in one big house and we all just race and train around there in Italy. I think the four processes of the academy moving to Italy was the Australians had done it for years and they brought through so much talent to the pro ranks. I thought they sort of wanted to try the same thing essentially. In the end of the day, amateur race and in Italy, it's the best in the world. So if you perform there, then you know, it sort of moves you on that conveyor belt to sort of make it as a professional road rider. and. Again, the races were that high profile. If you got sort of a top five in them, you know, sort of opens the eyes to pro teams saying, well, this guy's got some talent. You know, we need to sort of look at him in a bit more detail and see if he's worth signing. And um, was that the same group of guys you were with in Manchester? Yeah, those were the same group of guys in Manchester. So obviously being on the academy, the under 23, it's from when you're 18 to 22. So obviously guys were on there that were older than me and um, so when I moved on I moved on it with like um, like Alex Dowsett, Stephen Burke um, and then the guys that were already on it were guys like Ben Swift, Ian Stannard, Andy Tennant. Um, and when you're, when you're doing that is the changes to the team much is it kind of like you if you don't perform well you might switch up to someone else or is it do they give you a kind of set block of what you signed up for? through to your senior years and um well how it worked because obviously when you are racing in Italy there's you know there's a limit on how many can have in the team and maybe only six riders but again there was like 10 12 of us on the academy so everyone wasn't always going to guarantee to sort of be racing every race so um it was sort of based on who was going best and who was most consistent so would ride most of the races so that's sort of how it worked mm -hmm. and luckily I was one of the consistent ones, so I'd, <laughs> so I'd luckily I'd ride every race really. So, so, so what year did you move to Italy? That was two thousand and seven. Oh, okay, so and how did that first year go racing in Italy? Obviously, I guess a, a jump up in standard. Yeah, it was again, yeah. racing against not that you weren't you know, but men or maybe more mature men as well, just by the nature of being in. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. But I think the first year it was, you know. The younger guys were sort of helping the older guys who had already experienced a year in Italy or a season in Italy. Um, so the younger riders would just tend to help them. But then as sort of my form sort of moved on, then sort of I would sort of then move into more of a leadership role as well because obviously you can't be on form all mm -hmm. season long. So it's sort of we had to swap it around and work for different riders at different times. So... Um, and then halfway through the season, 2007, the European track champs and the 23 track champs were, were in Germany. So we moved back from Italy and we went to Newport for a training camp on the track. So we'd be there for a couple of weeks, just sort of getting our track legs back. And then we'd go to Germany for the European track championships then. And then sort of then after that, we'd then move back to Italy to sort of finish the road season out there. All right. And how were those track champs? They were good, yeah. I mean... Um, we ended up winning the team pursuit, so we were European champions in the team pursuit. Then I also wrote. So you're, so you're looking at here a team where it's under twenty three and you're eighteen in that team. Yeah, so I think it was me, um, Ben Swift, 
had a bribe. Um, and Dow set in that team and we won. And um, yeah. and then me and Ben Swift rode, because we had two places in the scratch race and the points race. So I rode the points race. I don't think I got anywhere. Maybe fifth or something. I can't remember exactly. And then me and Swift rode the scratch race and I ended up gaining a lap with three others or four and then Swift then just helped me then for the the end of the race and then I ended up winning the European title in the yeah. scratch race. It was a bit weird because I was obviously sprinting for the win and I couldn't remember exactly who the riders were that I gained a lap with. So I was sprinting at the end but then some some Italian decided to sprint full gas for the end and he wasn't sprinting for anyway, he was just sprinting for minor places. And then ended up crossing the line and I was thinking, have I won here or not? Because this Italian blow put his hand up and I'm thinking, I don't think I've won, I think I've come second. I was like, oh, it's a bit disappointing. <laughs> and then one guy, one a German guy who I gained the lap with, he said, oh, he wasn't in the one group that laughed. Yeah. So he said, oh, you've won. So I was like, oh, happy days. <laughs> so I ended up winning. German guy was second and some Russian guy was third. But that... German guy who was second to me was Roger Kluger. Okay, yeah. So he, um, I think he rides for um, Michelin Scott now, and he's been Madison World Champion. So it's high standard. Yeah, so yeah. he was, he wasn't then, but he's gone on in his career to be like Caleb Ewan's lead out man, and you know, riding all the six days, being Madison World Champion, and I think he's, you know, he rides the Tour de France and things like that. So that was the kind of sort of talent I was racing against. And that, not that I particularly want to jump massively forward in your story right now but where you see those guys doing that now and you obviously mentioned a load of cyclists there whether you know cyclists or not all of those names Matty and I'll know those names and you're involved in cycling or even on the peripheral you'll know those names they're racing most of them are pros now does it does it bother you now when you see that and think I could be riding that or if you comfortable in what's happened and which we'll obviously go into in a bit more detail in a minute but you comfortable where you're sat now and going well I, you know, you say you lost an opportunity but there was an opportunity to be doing something else and sat here with us in this yeah. wonderful studio, as good as that is. Yeah. Does, it, does it chip away at your head? Um, if you don't mind me asking. No, not at all. Um, you know, you know what happened, you know, sort of out of my control. Don't know why it happened, but essentially at least I'm still sort of able to do everything I was doing before. Okay, I'm not a professional cyclist anymore, but I'm still sort of involved within the sport, you know, so... I mean, I, I can't look back and think, well, what if that didn't happen? I'd potentially be a world champion, Olympic champion, and be riding the Tour de France. But you, you say that, though, but a lot of people do, and it's good that you can box it off and not let yeah. it torture you. Cause I'm... No, I, I try not to let it yeah. torture me. It never sort of bothers me. Right. So, so rolling through that year, the tracks, towards the end of that year, do you then go to the European Championships for GB? Yeah. Uh, under 23. What? Where was that in the world? Uh, that was in. Put you on the spot. In Cottbus, I think. Cottbus, is it? In Germany. Fair geography. Right, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. somewhere in Germany. It was like an outdoor track, so it was like, I think, 300 metre track, outdoor okay. concrete thing. So. <laughs> but it wasn't a bad thing. It suited me, so I wasn't <laughs> particularly bothered. But yeah, I mean, that was good having that in the season because obviously Italy being such. You know hilly terrain and being so hot a lot of us were always focused on you know if you didn't perform well in a race it was down to being too heavy so you'd just be dieting all the time and just eating basically nothing and around the training and things like that you know it was hard you know and you'd be hungry and you'd just be sat there on your bed shaking because you're so hungry but then in your head you think well i need to lose a couple of kilos to perform better on the climbs and things like that and be a bit pressure at the end of the races so Obviously, tracks different. You sort of, you know, your the f the intensity is shorter, but you sort of, you know, the damage you do on your muscles is a bit more. So you you need to eat a bit more to help your recovery. So I ended up putting on like those two, three, four kilos even that I lost. So then when I went did go back out to Italy in the second year, that's when I felt so much better. I felt fresh because I had I had a rest in a way because the tr the track you're not riding as much on the road so. I sort of rested a bit. I sort of gained a little bit more rate, so I was I was performing better in the second half of the season out on the road. So, so that's, yeah, out that's in oh eight. Yeah. No, this is in oh seven. Oh, late oh seven. Yeah. So what when you talk about weight, what kind of weight were you? Would be the two. Um, 
I'd be, I perform well anything between 70 and 72 kilos. Mm -hmm. You know, if I went any skinny, skinnier, anything below that, I wouldn't, I wouldn't perform. I wouldn't be that strong, you know. I just wouldn't feel healthy. So I sort of try to keep my weight around that way. There's quite a lot of focus in GB around. Yeah, there was, yeah, especially of. when we were in Italy, you know, we'd have like skin fold and skin mm. fold sort of measurements quite regularly just to see where you were. But sort of looking back, I sort of don't think it is the be all and end all of the weight, you know. Everybody's body structure is different, you know. Some, some people are going to be bigger than others. I mean, essentially, it's just power to weight really you know if you're comfortable at whether it be 75 kilos and you can f perform well that's fine you know mm -hmm. just because i don't know chris rooms 68 kilos doesn't mean that you being 68 kilos is going to work for you everybody's bodies are different so it's just what ever works for you it's like when i was out there ian stannard he was like 85 kilos sometimes even more and he'd perform well on the climbs it's just yeah. the power and the engine he had in his body so more yeah. than a, trying to drop down and from below that you just be weak then so so uh you move into uh 2008 still based in italy racing yeah because i mean obviously we went back to italy in the end of 2007 and we performed i started of performing well in races you know i was doing gaining top tens in these big you know uci races and then we only had three three spots because of what we qualified as a nation for um the world championship place we only had three spots in the world championship at the end of september in 2007 so the guys that got selected were me ian stannard and ben swift so obviously they were both second year seniors and i was first year so again there's no real um team role or team plan it was just basically you just survive and see who's there experience and, yeah. yeah and just see what happens really so that's the sort of tactics we went into there and then it ended up happening um ben swift ended up getting dropped and then he pulled out and then it was just me and ian stannard left and then basically stannard got dropped and then it was just me left in the group and i was just basically there to the end and uh, i remember coming round because it was in stuttgart in germany with a lap to go and i heard the commentator say oh one of these guys there's like 30 of us left at this point you know out of like 200 stars yeah. It was quite a hard course. It was a rolly course, but it sort of super suited me. You know, it's the kind of rider I was, and um, you know, punchy rider that would sort of sprint at the end, like the Manx roads. Yeah, exactly, like the Manx roads. Yeah. So I remember coming around with a lap to go, hearing the commentator saying, "Oh, one of these guys is going to become champion of the world from here." And I sort of, at this point, I went really nervous. Then we come around with a lap to go. I was sort of panicking. I was thinking, "Oh, I sort of need to sort of move myself to the front if I've got a good chance now." come it was like one kil kilometer to go and i was trying to sort of move my way up the group and then we turned a right hand corner it was like 400 meters to go and i was probably about 50th back or no I was, well obviously it wasn't 50 because only like 30 left i was probably like 20 wheels back and i sort of moved myself up on the right hand side and i just sort of put my head down and just give it everything and as i was going up the finishing straight i was just passing 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 these people to a point where there's only like two guys in front of me and i'm thinking shit i'm gonna win a medal here potentially potentially even win it but the line just come a bit too early i ended up crossing the line finishing third and i just ended up putting my hands up in the air well one hand thinking like shit i've just got third place in the under 23 world road race championships in my first year as an under 23 and i just couldn't believe it really and that was like yeah i just was so shocked but then that was just like the sort of conveyor belt for me to sort of move on really yeah, yeah. and catch everybody's yeah. eyes where in terms of pro teams and i was sort of in the position where i could sort of decide which pro team i wanted to join yeah right so that was pretty <laughs> cool yeah yeah the uh and what was it like the sort of emotion then getting on the podium that kind of thing that most of all never experience i was or still was kind of in a bit of shock yeah i mean i'd obviously been on podiums before but i did not expect to be on the podium in my first year especially in the road you know, I've never been on the podium in a road, road world championships before. Yeah. So to do it was really special. And, um, you know, it was the first British male to medal at a world championships road race in like 40 years. So the attention I got from that was, you know, it was massive and it sort of led me on to sort of do what 
I wanted to do from there really because I mean I ended up going home you know just for a bit of a break and then I was again back out on the academy in Manchester working hard building towards what I, want, what I wanted to do and give it another go on the road and the under 23 so it was too early to turn pro you know I needed at least another year to then turn pro the next year but I was lucky enough to get asked to go on a CSC training camp in that January of 2008 so they wanted to just Test invite me over and just see what I was like so I was in Mallorca with them riding for a week so they just you know that was a cool experience to be able to do that I see after getting your position there and saying about attention how did you deal with that was that was there a lot that you kind of doing that was there an expectation or kind of more emphasis on you to be churning out these results now and now pro teams might be knocking on your door and especially say at your age did it go through your mind did you feel extra every time you got on the bike or was it just you kind of let it um i guess like the younger guys because obviously then they had a new intake of academy riders like that there that year the next winter they would sort of look up to me you know whereas mm. i moved on to the academy and i'd look up to the older riders but then then they were looking up to me so you sort of shared that responsibility in that way but um yeah i mean i sort of i did go a bit complacent that winter you know i wasn't sort of as focused as i probably should have been so, so the guy we were chatting to recently he talked about maybe ego starts to come in and you can't get ahead of yourself i guess because yeah you had a, and obviously a brilliant fantastic result yeah and yeah yeah i guess like you say you, yeah, you I, can get complacent around that yeah, I had, I had an amazing year in that first year. You know, I then after the World Road Race, we basically went to the national track champs, and I we won the team pursuit, and I got like third in the individual pursuit, and then third in the points race as well. So I got like two medals in individual events, and then we won a team pursuit gold as well. So, you know, looking back, it was like you know I achieved everything I wanted to achieve that year. So then when I had the rest, and then in the winter, you know, I wasn't. I was focused, I still trained, but I sort of wasn't as focused as I should have been, so I ended up putting on like six kilos in weight, you know, I was, you know, eating too much and not being as sort of focused, disciplined. Yeah. being as disciplined, yeah, so then when I went back out to Italy for the road season, I then had like six kilos to use, and that's not a quick process, so I was always, I was struggling, you know, from the word off in the road season I wasn't performing as to how you know my potential should have done really and you say well, earlier on you were saying that when you first were cycling younger it was just you were enjoying it you know yeah did that kind so. of start changing then at that point of it your mindset being a bit different to just being on the bike to enjoy it um I was still enjoying it but at the end of the day I was an 18, 19 year old young lad, you know, and then I think like, you just want to enjoy yourself type of thing, you know, you know, we're going out sometimes, you know, when we shouldn't have done, we should have been having an early night folks in the training, but you know, in the day we're human sometimes, you know, you sort of need to let your hair down sometimes, but just become a little bit too regular, you know, yes. myself and other guys on the academy and then obviously that's when you put on weight and then you're not recovering as quickly as you should do from the training and you just sort of burn the candle at both ends really in that respect so you're not getting the best out of yourself so you know but I don't regret doing that at all you know it's what I needed to do so you know I was fine with that and then it just made things a little bit tougher when I did move back out to Italy than they should have been. So, so that r racing season starts in Italy 08 yeah. uh, so you're trying to I guess fight lose, lose a bit of weight uh, and uh, that was the year of Beijing. Yeah. So you ended up through that season in Beijing. How did yeah. that come about? Um, then after a couple of months, I did start. You know, the weight did start coming off, and I did start losing weight. And we, there was five guys on the road to represent GB on the road, and I road was always my long term objective, and I knew there was potential I could have got a place on the track team in maybe the individual pursuit um, but I thought well because road was always where I wanted to go I wanted to ride the tour and ride the classics and all that I thought I'll just focus on the road and turn pro at the end of 2008 
So I sort of didn't really focus on track, I just moved towards the road. So I ended up getting selected for the team in Beijing. It was me, Ben Swift, Roger Hammond, and Steve Cummings in the team. So me and Swift were just there for experience, you know, and Steve and Roger were this, you know, they were the other experienced guys were there to help. And it was a hard course, it was really hilly. It didn't particularly suit me as a rider, but I knew I was just there for the whole Olympic experience with the eye on 2012. Um, where then I'd potentially probably go towards more the track than the road, you know, because I'd have a chance of winning a medal. Um, so I, we obviously went into Beijing, you know, I'd lost my weight and things like that. And like, I knew I knew I was never going to finish the race. So I thought, well, what can I do to sort of get myself out there and do the best? So I thought I'd try and get in the early breakaway, which is what I did. So I... I was the only GB riders getting the early breakaway. So there was like 15 of us and in the break there was like guys like Jens Voigt and people like that. So all like big top pros and I was like this young 19 year old <laughs> GB rider so who sort of nobody knew about really. So I was, you know, really happy to make that breakaway. It's and important I, as well. So I suppose also for non-cyclists who might watch cycling and see these breakaways that last 200 miles and they always get caught near the end and kind of think why. But part of that, I suppose, is it's dual one obviously exposure is important but also from a team perspective if you've got teammates back in the group they have an easy ride because they don't have to do any chasing so it's perhaps if there's a German and a Spanish that have missed the break they're the ones doing all the chasing and burning guys so that role of getting in that breaks often missed as well by the general public how important that is as well yeah exactly it just allows your team leader or whoever you work with to relax a bit more yeah. so because the other nation is think well I've got a guy up the road I'm not going to get this breakaway back so it allows them to relax and in my head I just wanted to do it just for exposure for myself I knew it was going to be televised and I knew I was going to be on camera and essentially I wanted pro teams and people to see me that you know I am quite a decent rider mm -hmm. so and I remember it was like a flat loop to begin with and then we got to a big climb and then we do laps of the climb which was like it was like a six kilometer climb and then we'd loop back down and then go back up it again like every time and I knew once we hit that climb for the first time, I was going to go out the R. So, um, and it was so hot as well. And they had these showers on the climb. We were all single file on the left. And I remember the t uh, TV camera motorbike was coming down the line. So it'd be filming everyone along the line. And as it come past me, I looked at the camera and just waved on it. Then, Bye. That was it, yeah. <laughs> but then everybody said to me, oh, I remember seeing you in the Olympics waving on the camera. I was like, job done yeah yeah, yeah so everybody yeah, remembers yeah. me then because remember that i was in the breakaway and things like that you know i'd done a good drive because i was in the breakaway for like i can't remember exactly it must have been over 100 kilometers yeah. so it wasn't bad for me and then i got caught by the group and then i just climbed off basically the next yeah. lap and what was that whole olympics experience I mean, obviously it's amazing but how, how did you find that you know, i guess at the time i'm trying to think of the top athletes within just GB in general, you'll have seen them around the village, I guess. And yeah. was any of that ever? Were you ever sort of in awe of being in the same space as people like that? Um, no, it was good in that respect. You know, you'd be going to the food hall and you'd be queuing up for pasta or something, and in the line would be next to you. Usain Bolt would be next mm -hmm. to you. You know, just people like that, and you see Farrah walking around the thing, and you see. But it was it's quite funny because obviously there's so many different events, and obviously people are different shapes and sizes for these event events. So it was quite. You spend time guessing, oh, they might do a... Yeah, they're definitely a gymnast because yeah. they're so small. Yeah, yeah. But, or whether it be rugby sevens play or whoever it is. So, no, it's quite quite a cool experience. But at the end of the day, you being there, you know, is justified. You know, you are one of the best, mm -hmm. if not the best, one athletes within the country at your sport, at what you do. So, he didn't really feel out of place in any way at all. So, you just respect everybody that's around you, really. So, it's quite cool. It's again. It's not because I've been to the Commonwealth Games before. That it's not much different to the Commonwealth Games. You know, the villages are the same. The food halls. You know how it's all set out. It's just a level up because it is the Olympics. Yeah. So, yeah. so, so uh, at the end of end of oh eight, then you're looking at you've obviously pretty pretty strong belief now. You can get a pro contract, go pro. Uh, it's a career path for you. Yeah. You ultimately signed for Saxo. Were there other teams looking speaking to you? There was other teams, yeah, like a couple of Spanish teams and Italian teams, but I knew they were the best team in the world. They'd been the best team for the last like 
six, seven years, and they had all the best riders on their squad. So I knew I'd that they were looking for a British rider as well, and I knew they were the team I wanted to wanted to join. So I signed my contract, and then I rode with them for the last part of two thousand and eight. Um, when I rode the Tour of Britain with them, and then I rode um, Franco Belge, which was a, a stage race in Belgium at the end of the year. And again. Obviously, another ultimately another step up. How did you find those first races in a pro peloton? Yeah, it was good. I mean, Tour of Britain was, you know, it was good. I was really focused on. I wanted to perform and show that I am worthy of a place on the team. Um, so I mean, the guys who was on the team with me in the Tour of Britain, they've had a long year. You know, they've had been riding pro races all year round, and they're pretty tired. So they were just working for me, which was which was great. So then I could just do the best I could with them working for me which is great to do for your first mm. pro race as a pro rider basically so i mean i had guy matt goss in the team stewie o'grady lars back and um, chris anka sorensen so was a five-man team and me and i they were all working for me and these these guys you know stewie o'grady paru bay winner olympic champion and gossy was the same you know these are all top top riders they're all working for me essentially so mm. it was you know it's great feeling and great for the morale and you know and i performed really well as well i had like two top five finishes on stages and i was 12 overall in the end so it was you know it was, so obviously didn't feel like um, you weren't clearly out of your depth either that's no, i wasn't out of my depth at all um so you know i was pretty happy with that and it it was sort of confirmation for them that they made the right decision in so much as signing me to turn pro with them so so you go into then going pro full time with Saxo uh, in uh, 09 then yeah. looking to start 09 that first pro season so early yours I presume you have training camps and then they put a, put a race calendar together do you get much I assume that's the case and do you get much input into that that, that first year as a pro or do you kind of just get told what to do and um, do they give you much sort of are you allowed to have objectives or is it look your first year we expect you to do this this and appear here and be there yeah first year um, you know, we had the training camps and stuff. I think we had one in Mallorca, and then we had no, we had one in Denmark in November. So the the season before, which is like um, sort of like an army type camp. So it's like a base camp type thing, where it's just like a team building camp. So we do we like be in army barracks and stuff. And we got woken up at like three in the morning when we're all in bed, and we'd go into the back of these army trucks and just dropped in the middle of nowhere. And then we'd have to find ourselves. And get to a certain point and were you just thinking oh, this isn't riding a bike <laughs> yeah no, but it was so good it's such a great way to sort of get to know people you don't know and you have a laugh as well at the same time so that was that was really cool and i remember we were just walking for like 12 hours straight mm -hmm. and it was like we'd obviously because there was like so many members of staff and riders as well i think there was like 30 riders on the squad we'd obviously all be split up in groups but it was really good fun i mean really i really enjoyed that it's a great way to sort of get to know everyone mm. and obviously it's hard as well so it's not just sitting around yeah, doing yeah, nothing yeah. Thing. and, and the la la I meant to ask when we were talking about moving to Italy but then in that scenario as well you're dealing with many nations language wise I assume always principally it's English everyone speaking is it do, yeah, you, do you pick was, up English much was other? the first language right. yeah, so everybody spoke English did you m pick up much other language during those times away not particularly no no um, hey, everyone just trying to tune into your Man Manx accent yeah exactly Manx is person apparently <laughs> um, but yeah the only thing they couldn't understand is why English people put milk in their tea. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's the only thing they were sort of a bit like, why are you doing that? Well, yeah, I don't drink any tea anymore. I did back then, don't know why. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think that was the only thing. But everybody spoke English, which is perfect. You obviously pick up bits yeah. now and then, but not enough to be able to speak yeah, any yeah. other languages. Yeah. Just um, point, point and go Just on. point and go yeah, yeah. put your finger towards your mouth I yeah, want that yeah. Um, but yeah and I was lucky because when we were, when I was my first year as pro they always run like three programmes you'd have like the top programme and then like, like with the A team essentially well like the Grand Tour riders their sort of brace programme and then you have the classic riders and then you have the young group so I was obviously in the young group for guys that sort of just turned pro and we'd all race the smaller races together and sort of so then we could sort of play domestic role or sort of move into a leadership role because if we were in the other higher sort of teams that were doing the bigger races we'd just be domestics all the time yeah, so, yeah, yeah. which is fine but 
it's just part again the next yeah, stage of development it's, it's, yeah it's part of what it's about being a pro you know sort of learning your trade and sort of I was in that younger pool of riders so when I was there I had like Alex Rasmussen he's retired now Michael Moorcock he rides for Quick Step. so guys like that they were the guys that I was in the sort of smaller team with them and we were just doing all like the smaller pro racing and sometimes if we were going well we'd jump into the other squads and ride with them it was good though because it gave us the opportunity to actually perform like in I can't remember exactly which race it was I had a jersey you know I was in the points jersey and performing really well and um, you know it gave me the opportunity to ride um, San Sebastian you know I rode that in my first so, year yeah so for those non-cyclists it's one of the big classic one day racing races uh, in, in San Sebastian not surprisingly yeah yeah <laughs> yeah, and, um, so that's after the Tour de France. You get a lot of Tour de France riders riding that. So I rode with that, and we had like Andy Schleck. He was in the team and that as well. And so it was, yeah, it was good. Mm. And, and um, so that's out. That's through oh eight. This is oh nine. Oh nine. Sorry, yeah. yeah. Sorry, no, no. Yeah, yeah. Olympic. Yeah. So just, the, just a quick question. Just to, obviously, just we have some general show notes to chat about stuff, but just kind of cro- crossing in my mind there when you. You mentioned Rasmussen, and it just immediately springs into mind. I can't remember if it's the same Rasmussen. It was ultimately, it was certainly Rasmussen done for doing drugs for he won the tour. No, I don't know whether it was a different, yeah. but it just reminds. I suppose looking back now, was that something? Uh, obviously, it's a massive shadow, certainly historically of the sport. It's moving on, sort of very well, I suppose now. But was that something you were aware of at the time within the sport? Was that something that was ever talked about or seen, or maybe you don't want to talk about it? I don't know. Um, I never seen anything sort of dodgy going on when I was involved but I think like then when I turned pro it all sort of cleaned up in that sense yeah. you know because neo pros Cav for example who are clean were able to jump straight in and win so many races like Cav in his first year as pro I think he won 11 races and that was unheard of back then when it was you know quite you know drugs were sort of a thing a lot of psychs were to take yeah. Um, so that was unheard of you know because did you get many questions over you get an interview by media and stuff like that? Was there much, because there seemed to be a phase sort of watching from the outside where there was always an accusation around, and I'm not asking for accusation, you know, I just ask out of interest because, yeah, there seemed to be often insinuate, you know, you, you know, you really, you know, just insinuations around, not everyone was on it, but it was still a problem in the sport. Did you ever feel that from the outside? A little bit, yeah, because when, when I joined Saxa Bank for the first year, Alberto Contador signed for Saxon Bank as oh. well. So he was on it. And during that season in 2008, he tested positive. I can't remember for what it was. Um, you know, I can't remember what some substance he tested positive for. So all that was going on. Was that the beef incident? Yeah, the beef incident. Yeah, yeah. So all that was going on then. So obviously that was all yeah, yeah. overshadowing everything as well. So And is that something... To- talked about a, t- a team or g- team level as in you're around the table and I appreciate he's not going to sit there and say I've got a positive well maybe he does say I've got a positive test and, and does he try and defend his position in front of, in front of his teammates no, or, no, or nothing no. it's just sort of it was between we never really team heard, and it's just basically the manager to be on a Reese and him right. and the press guys that would talk about that we'd never talk about it right just because we didn't really need to yeah yeah sort of, yeah his thing he's dealing with it's yeah, not, right. yeah, yeah. it's not really going to affect us in any way yeah. hopefully which it didn't do so 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 the the first season ends as a pro I presume generally happy with it that initial contract was that a year, just a, a year two rolling? years two every year, time right. you sign pro you always get a two year contract okay. but um, yeah but my first year as pro in the September so I was on the long list for the world so that's when I had my accident when right. I was living in Italy so I obviously didn't really have yeah. a second year so, did, sort of. <laughs> so, so obviously a, a massive event in your life, uh, that accident, uh, not quite talk us through it, but you were obviously based down in Italy, yeah. had a motorbike accident, uh, I assume went straight to an Italian hospital. Yeah. What was the initial prognosis? Um, can, you, can you remember the accident? Oh yeah, I remember everything really clearly, yeah. I just remember I was out having food with Cav um, and then... He ended up going home after we had food, and I said, I'll go in, I need to go into the toilet to pay the bill. So I went in, and I left on my little Vespa scooter. It was literally like five kilometres from the town we lived in. So obviously he went, I just said, I'll see you for training at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. 
Um, and then I was just, it's just basically a big, long, straight road. There's nothing technical about it, no houses or anything around. And I was just driving along, probably five minutes from getting back to my apartment. And I just remember getting hit from behind. So I just remember getting hit, like going up in the air. And then that was it. Mm. Car, I assume. Yeah. Mm. So I've obviously got hit from behind, run over, and then just sort of left mm. down the road. Yeah, the, 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 the guy, the guy, girl, whatever, don't just know, didn't stop. Know. Never know to this day. No. Wow. All right. So, who finds you? Don't have a clue. Right. I don't know. What's your next recollection? Um, sort of waking up in hospital, really. Day, two days, like when was that? Oh, it was like, because I was in a coma for a month or six oh, weeks. Wow. So, it was a bit after that. But when I did woke up, wake up, I just thought I was only in there overnight. I was, I was unaware of what actually went on really you know my head was sort of all over the place and didn't have a clue what was going on or why or, or how or or the team with you or is it um, parents or well because I lived in Italy it was just me there but then when it happened um, my parents got a call mm. and just said you best come to Italy because Johnny's had an accident it's not looking good we think he's going to die right wow. so then they obviously come to Italy and then they said that he, we think he's going to live, but he'd be sort of quadriplegic, you know, sort of, for the rest of his life. Um, so, um, you spoke to him much about what they went through at the time? Well, I think they're still obviously affected by it now, obviously, because as a parent of that mm-hmm. happening to your child, it must be horrible, you know, especially being here on the Isle of Man and there in Italy and potentially going to die, you know. And then they turn up thinking, oh, we're here now. And they say, oh, you know, he may live, but he's sort of not going to be very well for the rest of his life. So You could only imagine, can you, that it's in some ways almost worse for them than you. Yeah. A plane journey out there, travelling oh, to, to what, horrible. yeah, to what, to, you know, like you say, for their, to travel for their son, to see their son. Yeah, I mean, I can't imagine what they went through. So obviously pretty shit time you know and during that induced coma they by your bedside yeah yeah up till the time you woke up because I was in intensive care it would there's only be like half an hour slots per person so they couldn't obviously just sit by my yeah, side yeah, all the no, time yeah, yeah. but there's like everybody dying around me in the hospital and there's me still surviving Um, then I did start you know I had you know I had operations you know on my head because I Shattered. Yeah, so tell us what you did break, or maybe you go through the list of what you didn't break. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, the thing, the funny thing is, though, like before my accident, I never broke a bone in my body in my life. So you and made I, up for it in one go. Yeah, so in one go, I just probably break the most important one. And um, so I fractured all my face, so nose, cheekbones, eye sockets, and I smashed the left hand side of my skull. And the fragments of the bone went into the sack of my brain. And then I had a blood clot on the back of my brain and on the front. And so I had to, they had to operate on me. So they cut me from one side of my head to the other, pulled my face down and put, put a metal plate here on the left-hand side of my face. So I've got a metal plate here now just to obviously... Be through the airport. Be yeah. Through the airport. Front, it's, it doesn't actually happen, though. I mm. don't know why. Um, and... Um, yeah, so I put a metal plate there and then I f- fractured my sternum um, and I damaged my, um, what's it called, my nerve here. Down your leg, down your Down my calf, yeah, it's the perineum, isn't it, nerve, so I damaged that nerve Failed there. doctor school. Yeah, and um, so I had like a dropped foot, oh, so okay. obviously when I did become, try to get stronger, that was always stopping me from walking probably because my foot was just basically tripping me on the floor. Mm. Um, but then I was sort of, once I got operated on, I was coming through all that. Um, I was obviously being fed by the peg tube in my stomach. Um, so obviously I needed to eat in some way. And um, But in Italy they sort of do things a bit different. They don't put the peg tube through your mouth. You know, so it did get misplaced. They just attach it back together through your mouth but they just basically put a like a hose pipe in my stomach 
and basically fed him from through there. Mm-hmm. Now, because I was on so many drugs and stuff, and I was just having such mad, crazy dreams, I was pulling this. I pulled this tube out, and um, then they put it back in my stomach. Well, stomach. What well, they attempted to put in my stomach, but didn't put it into my stomach. So all the food that they were pumping in wasn't going into my stomach. So apparently, I don't really remember this. Apparently, I just went grey. I went grey, and my Adam's apple went like the size of a cricket ball. And um, it's infection inside. Yeah, so I got infected. So I got peritonitis, and then they had to basically emergency operate on me. So I nearly died from the head injury, and then they nearly died from the stomach problem as well. So they had to cut me open. And that's when I lost so much weight. Um, so I went from like 70 kilos to 45 and I was just skin and bone thinking I'm going to be a good climber now yeah yeah (laughs) Um, so I've seen some pictures I can I'm sure you can google the pictures uh, yeah I've got loads I can uh, can yeah yeah, we'll we'll share them out on social media yeah yeah Um, because I've got because my dad sent me loads of like videos that he had on the laptop of me walking for the first time and you know I got like massive bed sore on the back of my head obviously because I was laid back from, uh, for so long and then now I've got scars on the back of my head things like that but how, I long, used to, how long were you in the hospital for in total then? I was in hospital from it happened my accident was on the 19th of September so obviously I went to hospital then <laughs> <laughs> and then I walked out of the Wellington in London in the end of March 2010 so six months seven months in hospital yeah, when, did they ship, when did they ship you back to the UK? Yeah, so they flew me back in a doctor's plane after two months in Italy. And I went to the Princess Grace first in London. And then I went to the Neuro Rehab place after there in the Wellington. And I was there for like two or three months, you know, doing all my rehab. You know, learning how to walk, talk. And because obviously, because of my brain injury, it affected my swallow and things like that. So I didn't have the strength to swallow food. So I had to gain strength to do that again. I had to learn how to stand up, walk, and everything again. So, and were you? Is there a point where I suppose you wake up and you know, not say that not the drugs wear off, but you become a conscious enough to to know then that that you've just got this massive battle ahead of you. I guess that you think you're thinking. Um, you know, talk about thinking about you know learning to walk again. That's it's just a bonkers, it's a no, bonkers it was, thing. It was to... horrible, man. You know, not even just to do the simple things like brush your own teeth. Couldn't even do that. To have somebody to shower me and like, th- you know, it was horrible. I didn't even have the strength to sort of lift myself off the bed. Nothing like so, so, so skinny and so weak. It was just horrible, man. Like you know, you just walk into the toilet. You know, these are things on a daily basis you just take for granted. And then mm. when it's sort of taken away from you, it's sort of realise how hard it is and then being in a wheelchair for so long and being pushed round and things like that, you know. It was a pretty hard time, but in my head all I was thinking was I just my focus like through the rehab, I just treated it like I was training on my bike in the sense that whatever I was doing during the day I was, my long term goal was just think I just want to get out and just get back onto my bike. And that sort of helped me in through the process because I knew that, you know, I still had a contract with the team and I knew they were going to be good and give me the time to sort of build myself back up. So is that, does that, do you think looking back when you look at, we talked earlier about uh, being in the GB squad and you know, you're just about to go on TV and you're just working through your process of, I need to do this, this is my job, focus on this, kind of ignore everything around it, just applying that same to this, which is a different race of of a guy and different fight. Yeah, and it just needs that that same process, that same mentality. Yeah, basically, yeah, because I knew that whether I'd be doing physio, occupational therapy, speech therapy, whatever it was, I knew if I give it everything I've got, I know that I'll get to essentially where I want to be after. So that's the sort of mentality I went in there with that, you know. And then I had like a patient I got friendly with in there who who then asked me for advice. You know, Johnny, can you give me any advice? How I'm going to be able to walk again? And, things like that so I'd sort of you know I'd become somebody in there that other patients would look up to in hospital because they'd see how quick I was sort of moving forward and they sort of wanted to understand why and I'd just talk to them like I've just said to you yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. how I've improved so quickly so do you think uh, under, underline you would you say you're a driven person I think so yeah I think you know I am I get 
I get bored very easy. Mm. So I always have to sort of focus on something. Is that you telling us to wrap this up? <laughs> no, no, not at all. I, I, yeah, again, if I was bored, I'd just tell you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm quite... No, I do struggle to relax and do nothing. I always have to do something. Mm. Not just pointless things, you know. I sort of... Once I'm working or working towards a certain goal, I give it everything I've got, you know. Whatever it may be. So in that aspect, then did you kind of, in essence, like surprise the doctors around there on how quickly you were able to recover? Were you were you on a longer time frame to actually be able to get back to where you wanted to be, or was that you driving and saying, you know what, as you said, there's the I'm going to put 100 percent and get back as soon as possible. Yeah, I think a lot of doctors and nurses and that they always write you off, don't they? They always got worst case scenario. Mm-hmm. So I just. I just knew if I just was a focus on where I wanted to be, if it didn't happen, it didn't happen, but I'd then not regret it. I just work hard towards it and then try and get there. Again, it may not have got, got me there, but if it did, then great. Cool. If it didn't, then... Was there an element of you actually not being able to get there? You know. Um sometimes I had to be a little bit patient in so much as you know I sort of had to take things slower during the rehab and then whereas I wanted to just sort of yeah, yeah. Go, go. Yeah. be able to run around the corridor straight away but obviously that wasn't never going to happen so I just had to take things slowly so obviously I was so weak as well I get tired so easy as well you know I'd regardless around what I was doing I'd just be sleeping all the time because obviously my body's recovering so you know like even little things just walk into the toilet or walk into the physio room it would take it out of you you know so um, I just had to be focused and patient and just take my time with where I wanted to go but when I did leave hospital in that March time the woman on reception said to my dad you know I've never seen anybody walk out of here mm-hmm. you know because most of the people that do go in there they always just end up coming out in wheelchairs yeah, yeah. so you know, well, it shows the hard work paid off yeah mm-hmm. well, I don't know I mean I guess I did work hard but yeah, I'd, say, I'd say so I think you. Yeah. it's sometimes hard to self-reflect and see that but clearly the reception is saying that to you and clearly back the September before you were yeah. not in the greatest shape in the world yeah. yeah but then like when I did come out of hospital obviously I still I was recovered enough to be discharged but I wasn't I was still it took me like two years after that to actually recover properly I was still weak I was still really skinny I still looked ill you know, even though when I come back to Ireland, everybody's saying how, how well I look. So I'm like, why are you lying to me? I don't look well, clearly, you know. But I'd rather you just say, oh, you look terrible, Johnny. Don't say to me, oh, you look really well, Johnny. Well, maybe in comparison to... Yeah, six months earlier. Six months yeah. earlier, yeah, maybe that's what they meant. But, yeah. yeah, so I did, yeah, it took me a while. And I remember my first road ride on the Island Man. Yeah, and I said to my dad the night before, I'm going out with a club run tomorrow. Which again is a beauty about the Isle of Man, you know, there's somebody out <laughs> at the NSC gates every morning. Whether it just be one or two people is better than riding on your own sometimes. Um said to me, Dad, oh, I'm going out on the club run tomorrow. And he looked at me and goes, Why are you shy going out on the club run? He said, You won't be able to keep up. So I was like, I will. I said, I'm fine. Um, he's like, I'll tell you what. I said, What we'll do is we'll go to Braid around the Stugadoo circuit. Um, Stugadoo. <laughs> Manx, Manx. That's Manx. in the Alaman for those overseas listeners. <laughs> yeah. It's spelled S to no, no, Yeah. Do, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> so I thought, he goes, oh, we'll go around the Stugadoo circuit. I'll drive out in the car and then I'll follow you behind the car. I was like, yeah, okay, no worries, whatever. In my head, I'm thinking, oh, I'll do at least five laps. Can't remember how long it is. It's about a six, seven mile circuit. Yeah, yeah six, yeah. seven mile circuit. So I thought, I'll do that. And literally got on my bike. And I was so, so weak. I literally didn't have the strength to get out of the saddle. I thought I was going to get blown into the hedge as well, because obviously it's so windy all the time on the Alan Man, and I'm so skinny. Either I was going to get blown over the hedge or dropped a fall down the grid. <laughs> so I carried on, and I was like, literally after one lap, I was absolutely bollocks, and I thought, I'm going to stop here. Like, but then I thought, well, no, I can't do this one lap. I'll do at least another lap. Prove me dad wrong. Yeah, prove me dad wrong. I'll just keep going until I actually drop off the bike. Um, but yeah, I'd done two laps and I was so, so tired after. And that was a big eye-opener in the sense that I was... thought, well, shit, I have got a long way to go here. And I just need to take things step by step and maybe gain a bit of strength in the gym 
or on the indoor training before you can think about going out on the road again. And what month was that in the year? That was April. Okay. Yeah, so you've only been out of hospital a month. Yeah. yeah well, yeah. I come out at the end of March. I think it was like two weeks after. <laughs> oh, that's all right then. Yeah. yeah right. So just going back to, you mentioned earlier about speech, learning to speak again. What, you know, is that speech therapy, etc. Is that, you know, as stupid as the question might probably sound, you know, you, it, I don't know how to, you obviously know how to speak, but it's just, is it just retraining your vocal cords? The information's in your head. You just yeah. can't get it out, I assume. Yeah, basically, yeah, because obviously I had a tracheostomy for so long that obviously affected it as well. And I just, when I was talking, I'd just get loads of mucus and stuff and I'd just be like coughing all the time and like just felt clogged up, you know, like that cold type feeling in your throat. So I just, as I, my throat got stronger, then I was just able to speak more. I was quite nasally. I was always, I still am a little bit nasally now, but like I it just sound like I was just full of like a blocked nose all the time when I was talking. But then as over time, then obviously it's got stronger. I've been able to talk a bit more clearer <laughs> and understand me. Like when I was talking before, like my mum and dad couldn't understand me because it was just, just like grunting all the time. Mm-hmm. They couldn't actually hear me properly. Then again, as time gone on, I just gained more strength and I was able to talk more clearly. And that even applies with the walk. And like even when I did come out of hospital, okay, I was able to walk, but I was still a bit doddery, you know, and like not walking as a normal person would walk. And it took me like two years to get that back, you know, let alone trying to ride a bike for a living at the same time as well. So it was a combination of things and just building that strength up and building up the confidence. And... um yeah, it's just, yeah, it was, it was hard, but it went relatively quick. And you just saying there how long it's taken you to get to that stage. What were Saxo like with it? Were, were they pressured or were they, they were, understanding? They were really, really, really supportive. They were so supportive, you know, like Bjarne and a guy called Trey Greenwood, who was one of the CEOs of the company as well. They, flew to London to see me and they supported me through the rehab you know you know I, I'm always thankful and grateful for that um GB not so much which was surprising you know I was um you know one of Britain's next best riders coming through the rank you know I was I had so much potential to achieve what as a GB rider would be paid to achieve you know you know mm-hmm. I was one of the best guys you know so Saxo re-signed me for another year and then Team Sky were going to set up the um, team the next year and um, <coughs> Sky promised me to buy me out my contract and sign me for that when they were going to start. So my, because Brailsford was in Italy with Shane at the time because they were setting up Sky my dad said to Brailsford, he said, are you going to still stick by Johnny and support him? Dave was like, yeah, yeah, no worries, we'll stick by him, support him, and, you know, he's still got a place on the sky. And um, basically, they just walked away from me. Mm. Didn't support me at all, didn't give me... The only thing they did support me was with a, a nutritionist, but it's not massive support really you know when I needed to be over in Manchester doing all the rehab there still even after coming out of hospital I still needed to continue all that because I wasn't at full strength yet so I did need that support and um, but all that the only people they were interested in supporting was um, what's his name the rower Cracknell is it yeah yeah, yeah. remember he had that accident during the yeah. Ram race across America yeah. and he had like a bad head injury as well yeah and they, were, they had him in training him getting him back to full strength rather than helping me you know which I was a little bit disappointed with and then I ended up getting kicked off the GB plan because obviously it's a performance thing and if you don't meet the grade then unfortunately there's you're no place. to do two laps of stuck a do then. yeah exactly yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah well I thought that was the grade but <laughs> <laughs> clearly not so um I uh, was then sort of put to one side of GB but then I was still with Saxo bank for another year and that was hard and again all I was doing is going to races and just surviving the race and just trying to finish and then that sort of took the enjoyment yeah. out of riding for me you know I wasn't racing I was just there surviving and obviously I didn't get my contract renewed after then but I 
I still sort of wanted to still cycle at that point, but then I just went to. Did you think you still had it? Do you think with all I the think battles? physically, yes, I still could have made it back to where I was before. Okay, it would have took taken a long time, understandably, but I don't. But just something inside me mentally just didn't want to do it before, and I just sort of kept going with smaller, mediocre teams because I knew nothing else other than cycling. Obviously, I left school early. Cycling's been my life for so many years. I was thinking, shit, what what can I do within my life now? You know, I'm screwed in that sense. Mm -hmm. But that's when I sort of sat down and thought, well, I still, okay, I want to step away as a rider, but I still want to be involved in the sport in some way. You know, I've gained a lot of experience in my short career. You know, I think I'll be able to help other people out. That's when I sort of, sort of then getting my coaching qualifications with British Cycling so I was able to start to help and provide training programs and people with the long term of moving then into a team role and sort of being a bit more hands on and moving on, you know, being like a director of sport chief or like a manager of a team, whether it be women or men. So you started studying those coaches before you retired? Uh, basically, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Just so I had something to sort of fall back on. But then I thought I don't want to live on the Alaman at this point. I thought you know, there wasn't a lot of opportunities for me, what I wanted to do mm. here. So I thought I need to move away. So that's when I applied for a coaching job in London at the Olympic Park there in Stratford, you know, coaching sessions and things like that. And I thought if I get the job, then I'll just move to London and just see how it goes, basically. And that's what I've done. So, so what year was that would be now? <sighs> um... Either 2014 or 2015. Mm. So, because my last, I think, I think because I, I went to the Commonwealth Games in Glasgow, I didn't race, but I went there. That obviously wasn't the plan, but I just wasn't good enough to mm. make the team. So that was when I thought, you know, I'm stopping now, and then I need. And how do you fall out of love with the sport to a point? For a rider, like, yeah, yeah. For racing. Yeah, right. I just didn't. I just had no motivation about and train. You know, I'd look at my training program and it'd be like five hours and be like, do not want to ride five hours, let alone five minutes on my bike. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a shame, isn't it? And that, do you think that's just from, because you've, you know, four years earlier that you're climbing up this, you know, this mountain and suddenly you're five levels further down maybe or, you know, further yeah. down and the battle's just worn you out maybe? Potentially, yeah, I think unaware to me at the time hmm. I think the whole hospital process and the rehabilitation it probably took it out of me mentally more than I actually realised at the time you know it was you know it wasn't easy and then you're seeing all these guys that you were racing with you know achieving all these great things and then you know like Olympic champions and things like that and then you're know, like well if I didn't have this I would have been Olympic champion now or world champion but maybe that did take its toll but I just didn't have the drive to Mm. want to do it anymore and I thought it's too hard a sport like most sports are to just do it for the sake mm. of it because you're getting paid so that's when I started looking at other avenues to get in um, so it was December 15 you formally announced your retirement yeah uh, was that when you kind of consciously made that decision did you did it feel like a weight off your shoulders a little bit yeah because I mean I was on a coaching course at the time I flew over to Wales to do a three day course in Newport and it was literally the night before I was starting that course that's when I thought I'll announce it to say Johnny Bellis is no more within yeah, the cycling yeah, yeah. well competing anyway yeah so so the, so the coaching starts do you find that rewarding yeah I did yeah especially when people start improving and it is down to you and but who, like who are you coaching um, I'm or just coaching like guys from just in the UK no one sort of big but clients are clients at the end of the day I mean it's just a lot of people I coach are sort of just average riders you know do like sportives and things like that but they just want to regain that enjoyment again from cycling you know I've had coaches previously and they've obviously taken it too seriously stopped enjoying riding the bike and then they just stop and then they don't ride the bike again and they just want to work towards something else with a different coach and a different outlook because coaching's not it's not rocket science you know anybody can uh, apply you're and, selling your services now Johnny <laughs> no but I'm just saying yeah. like people can write down a program and say do this but I I think communication with your rider is so important 
um, you know, and it's not just about providing the plan, you know, you're there for somebody to talk to, you know, oh, Johnny, I felt shit today, is there a reason for that? Or whatever it may be, you know, it's about giving somebody morale and I've got experience on both sides when things have, because the thing with cycling, 99% of the time, things are shit, things are hard, but that 1% where you do get a result or achieve something that you want to achieve, it, it's so satisfying, it mm. makes them time so much more worthwhile, so... You know, it's about getting people through that, and as long as they're enjoying it, that is the most important. Because if you're not enjoying it, what's the point? You're paying somebody to provide you a plan. If you're not enjoying it, why waste your time? Yeah, yeah. Take up another hobby, take up fishing or darts or something, you know? It's like you don't have a bit less stressful. Yeah. yeah, you don't have to cycle, you don't. It's just do something you enjoy doing. Do you ride a bike much now? Um, I do now and then. I'm not just a fair weather rider, so. <laughs> doesn't happen very often over here <laughs> but i i take um like what bike classes up at cycle 360 twice a week so i enjoy doing that and yeah. they're good fun as well so i enjoy doing them and at the minute that's my only riding i do and i just go to the gym now and then but like i'm lucky i don't sort of put on any weight it's like my metabolism's changed since my accident for some reason since my brain injury so like before when i was a rider i was quite a big stocky rider for a cyclist but now I'm sort of the opposite so it's like I have a super quick metabolism and I don't really put on any weight which is a good thing and the fact that I've lost my smell and taste sensation since oh, my really? accident yeah um, you don't sort of crave rubbish food in any way right. so that's a good thing as well you know for all the sensations you could lose smell and taste is not it's not so bad so it's just not very good if there was a fire somewhere and you obviously wouldn't smell it yeah, well, yeah, yeah. When well, yeah. the old man was was a fireman, so yeah, no, yeah. no following down his foot, footpath. No, not at all. So, so then uh, communicating with you with the guys you coach, you a lot of that online, I guess, and they're dropping your emails, text, yeah, you know, or just by what WhatsApp, yeah, text, yeah. things like that. But um, you know, I would, you know, I would be open to sort of get more involved with the team in the future, whether it be sort of taking Isle of Man teams away, whether yeah. it be Island Games, Commonwealth Games, things like that. You know, because I think. Having someone like me in a team car, you know, I sort of know how it all works, and yeah. you know, I think, you know, I'd be quite a good person to have, whether it be a debrief or a brief before a race. You know, I sort of tactical wise, I sort of know what to do, so I think I'd be quite valuable in that respect. For sure. So, so then, just looking generally back on your cycling career, you seem obviously very proud of what you achieved up to the, mm. well, throughout that throughout that time. Yeah, definitely, hundred percent. I mean. What I achieved, okay, my career was cut short and it didn't, it wasn't as long as I would hoped it would be. You know, obviously, I'm 31 now, would have been still riding now for sure. But I can look back and think, well, what I achieved in that short career, you know, people wouldn't even think, dreaming of achieving. So, again, you know, going to the Olympics at 19 is, you know, a massive highlight. You know, I've won national championship titles, medals in the world championships, European titles, you know. It's um, you know, it's massive. If I look back, and not many people can say they've achieved what I've achieved. So, um, you know, I just like to stay involved within the sport yeah, and just yeah. pass my experience down yeah. and help other people. Really, I was going to talk then. Yeah, just you mentioned just briefly a moment ago about what what's next. So yeah, just continue to coach riders. Yeah, continue yeah. to coach riders and just again within cycling, you know nothing's ever guaranteed whether you're in a team as a rider or as a manager or whatever it may be but I'm sort of open to any opportunities really and if it suits me then great so um, but, and if people want to get in touch with you talk to you about yeah coaching, coaching teams, things like how, that. How, how do they get involved how do they um, just send me an email basically if um, they just go on my website and they can just send me an email yeah on that thing called insta yeah, well, I'd, yeah, or just email me info right. at bellascoaching.co.uk. Yeah, okay. we can put links up and yeah, yeah, we'll put some links in the footnotes. Yeah, and then if whatever it may be, it doesn't matter because a lot of people always say to me, Oh, I don't think I'm good enough to be coached by you. Well, it doesn't matter, a plan's a plan. It doesn't mm -hmm. matter if you're riding a Tour de France or you're just riding a local sportif once a year, it's fine. It's, it's just giving you that structure around what you do. Yeah, and if you say to me, Oh, I'm only able to train six hours this week around my work or lifestyle then I just adjust your training around that really. yeah. and then keep that open line of communication to yeah but you just talk to me yeah, yeah, yeah I'm yeah. always quite detailed in the training I provide you know it's going to be a hard session 
But I always believe people always feel what cracks me a bit with coaching people is people they don't like resting. But rest is so important around your training. If you don't rest properly, the training you do is not going to be beneficial in any way. I used to enjoy my rest days when I was a pro. I couldn't wait. Mm. When I had a rest day, I'd sleep till like 11 o'clock. And I'd just literally do nothing for the whole day. Okay, mm. I'd feel lethargic because the first time i go back out on the bike. But like a day later, I'd feel great. So it is, rest is so important and communication. You see it, at, I mean, you see it at club level where, you know, you go out and you get a bit of a kick in off someone and maybe I'm sure it's different the same in other sports and your instinct is I'm not going well enough I need to that you know your default is I need to train more yeah. to get better and you're probably doing the opposite you're getting yourself more tired so next time you go out yeah, the, the, the training isn't beneficial and therefore you just you, your form's going the wrong way you know down the incline rather than up it yeah exactly yeah and what people a lot of people tend to do whether it be cycling or know any sport if they don't perform at the level they expect to, not being un, not being delusional or unrealistic, it's always the coach that gets the blame. And then they go jump from coach to coach, saying, oh, I'm going to get a new coach because it'll be different. No, what needs to change is you as a rider. And if you listen to what the coach is telling you, then you will see the imp- improvements. Mm. And it, it's not just going to happen overnight. It takes time. So mm. just have that patience and just listen and take on board what they're telling you. Because at the end of the day, you're paying me because one, I'm more experienced than you. Two, I know what I'm talking about. And three, them two things are going to make you a better yeah. rider. Yeah, yeah. So it's about listening to what the coach is saying. And if you're not, you're not going to see any improvements. And jumping from coach to coach is not going to make any difference at all. The outcome will be exactly the same. Yeah, well, I'll be signed up for a training coach. It's my friend. <laughs> rubbish up for about 10 years. Uh, so thank you for that, Johnny. Thanks no, for coming in. Very much appreciated. Thanks uh, for very me. interesting chat. Very interesting chat. Mm. Uh, so Matt do you want to just remind our listeners where to find ourselves yeah I'll do the usual housekeeping um, so you can find us on our all the outlets iTunes Spotify SoundCloud um, please like subscribe and share and if you'd be very kind enough give us that five star review to help boost on, our no audience that makes sense, no, makes sense. Um, Facebook we're under the M Word Podcast Twitter our handle is Manx Sports Pod and on Insta we are the M word IOM. Yeah. Great. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for letting us poke into your ears for, for well, a fair amount of time. Just word out from Martin. And word out from Matt. <laughs>